Father God, for keeping us and blessing our lives. God, we praise you, Father God, for there is none like you. There is no one, nobody, nobody like you, Lord. And Lord, we honor you today. We praise you. We magnify you. We lift you for just being good and being God. Thank you, Father God, for the mind to worship you, for a mind, Father God, to walk with you. We thank you, Father God, for your word on tonight. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for our sins. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will reveal that we have been with the Lord. Bless us, Father God, as you, that we study your word. We will hear from you. And Lord, you will bless our lives. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Amen. There is none. in the book of Jude and we will look to go to verse 25 on tonight we in, in Jude we, I think we covered 16 on last meeting so we'll rehearse what we did in, in verse 16 uh, Jude verses 16 through 25 is where we will land tonight Amen we serve God who does miracles so great and there is not like him songwriter said, if you're looking for a miracle, God has it. God has your miracle. We ended last week with verse 16, and verse 16 says, these are grumblers. These are complainers. Walking according to their own lust. And they, they mouth great swelling words. <coughs> flattering people to gain advantage. Jude is still talking about the false prophets and the false teachers. And he talks about the fact that these false teachers and these false prophets, they do everything for their personal gain, for their own advantage. They're not looking out for you. They're not looking out for the people. They're not looking out for anybody around them. They're doing it for their own personal and their own selfish Gain. Anyone who do not recognize Jesus Christ that he has come in the flesh, Jude said, these are false prophets. So when we look at the book of Jude, we've understood very well that there are false prophets among us as there were in Jude's day. And these false prophets that are among us are spewing out ungodly stuff. And Jude says they're being led away by their own lust. Jude says that their mouths are swelling with these great words. Jude said they are flattering people. And this flattery is simply for their own advantage, their own gain. And whatever they do, if it looks like they're doing something for you, you better believe they're going to end up for their advantage. Everything they do, everywhere they go, every time they spend, every person they spend time with, 
is simply for their own gain. They do nothing without having their own advantage, their own gain in mind. And he said in verse 17, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 17, don't you get caught up in that. He says in verse 17, you remember the words that were, were preached to you, taught to you, and spoken to you by the apostles. That's why the Bible always says we need to follow the, the apostles' doctrine. We must be concerned about the apostles' doctrine. The true doctrine of God. Because people come up with new stuff every day, don't they? They want to spew on you and you're supposed to get here. They want to blow on you and you're supposed to get here. They want to patch on your head and you're supposed to get here. These things men come up with. And yes, God used men. God uses men. God uses them. He actually says that if anyone among you sick, let them come before the church, bring, the, bring them before the elders, Anoint them with oil, lay hands on them, and that which is sick ought to be made well. Isn't that right? But it ought not be such a great demonstration. What do I mean when I say great demonstration? What, what am I saying? It ought not be such a great demonstration. What, what am I saying? A show. A show. That's why the old deacons used to pray, Lord, here I am again, coming by before the mother's dust once again. Lord, here I am. I come for no shape, form, nor fashion, or outside show. We coming because we want to hear from you, Lord. We're coming because we want you to hear from us, Lord. We are coming, Lord, with the right motives in our hearts. We are coming so that you, Lord, can hear from us. Because, God, we can't do without hearing from you. We got to hear from God. You know God is speaking. He's speaking every day. And we need to hear from God. God needs to hear from us. And we need to hear from God. Remember prayer is a dialogue. We talk to God and God talks to us. And it's very simple. If you want to know if God is speaking, it is already written in the word. And if God speaks, then he will not speak anything that's contrary to his word. But you, my dear, my, you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. It suggests that there are followers of people that are not Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, he's saying to us, even, even tonight, there are people who are following others that are opposed to Jesus Christ. He says, you remember what was spoken to you. You remember what was taught to you by the apostles of Jesus Christ. Then he says to us that there are some apostles that are not of Jesus Christ. Wow. And here we are thinking all along, that if they're apostles, they got to be of God. They have to be of Jesus Christ. But the text says that these things were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it says that there are some apostles that are of Jesus. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. They do their own thing. They create a way. And everything they do is laced with lust. What's the difference between love and lust? Is there a difference? Or do you take one to get to the other? What's the difference between love and lust? Anybody? Love is a desire. Love is a feeling. I didn't understand. Love is a desire. Okay. Love Okay, so, so let me see if I can interpret what you just said. Lust is a desire, and love is a true feeling. So is it not true that lust and love is a desire, but one have different motives, one have a different objective, and then the root of lust comes from a different place than love? Where does lust come from? 
Anybody? Flesh, the devil, other folk. Are you with me? And yet that's true, Sister Darren. We have lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Happy birthday, Sister Darren. Thank you very much, sir. So when we look, I just said happy birthday. That's all, all, that's all I want to get out. <laughs> so don't let the devil push you toward lust. Allow him to push you toward love. But will the devil push you toward love? If he chooses to, he will make it look real. If he chooses to, he will make it look glamorous. Will a dope dealer have his ride from now on? Will he always ride like he rides? Will a dope dealer always ride like he rides? And the dope dealer will ever even tell you, I'm blessed of the Lord. But is he really blessed of the Lord? The devil has a way of presenting things to us. And it's those things that we lust after. The Bible says that we're led astray by our own fleshly desires. Our own fleshly desires. And so if we have fleshly desires, it means that, that we want it, we like it, we saw it. We act upon it. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eye and the pride of life. Whatever we lust after, it's going to make us look good because we're proud. Whatever we get, whatever we want, whatever we lust after, it's, and when we talk about the pride of life, it, we're going to turn, we're going to look good in the midst of it. It's going to turn out good for us. Lust of the eye, it's gonna, it is going to look good. When we see it, we're going to go, woo-wee. My mood you go. It's because the temptation in our eyes, when we yield unto it, this lust pulls us into captivity of sin. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, what makes us feel good. I had a big old bowl of ice cream. That was lust. <laughs> but it sure did feel good going down. And this time, it was blue bell. You know that was lust. If it was blue bell, it had to be lust. Why well, say if it was blue bell, it had to be lust? I could have got briars or dryers. It's all ice cream, right? But when we really want to get our lust on, we'll pay double for it. See, that's lust. That's, that's temptation. That's of the devil. We ought to be saying right now, get the hints. So the lust, the lust, the lust that we fall into pulls us away from Jesus Christ. Verse number 18. He's talking about the, the doctrine, the words, the principles, the fundamentals that was laid out by the apostles, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be markers. They warned us. And Jude comes again, even in the 21st century, to warn us that they're going to be markers. What are markers? Markers. What are markers? 1,001. Anybody? Who make fun of or make light of. Okay, make fun of make light of. In this case, we're talking about those who make fun, make light of, of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Markers will come in the last day. Do we see anybody making fun of the church? Anybody making fun of the people of God? Anybody making fun of Christians? In these last days, markers will come who will, who will walk according to their own ungodly lust. 
the ungodly lust. Now he's going to use ungodly several times. Ungodly means not of God. Ungodly means against God. So here they are, they have this ungodly lust, and they walking. This word walking means they living in it. They, their conversation, they have this conversation in the Greek. This word walking means that you have a lifestyle with it. We all sin, right? Anybody that? We all sin. But it all, sin ought not be a lifestyle for us. We may slip in sin. We may, we may drift in sin. But as we keep reading today, you're going to notice that it doesn't talk about us falling in sin. It's talking about us stumbling. Let's read further and see. He says, there'll be walkers among you, and they will walk according to their own ungodly flesh. These are sensual persons. Sensual. This word sensual means fleshly, means worldly. Worldly people. Worldly people are those people who do not acknowledge God, who do not, do not live by the principles of God. Saved people can be worldly. I remember going to a brother's first sermon. He preached his first sermon and he couldn't hold himself. When he got excited, he started dancing the wrong way. And this was before running man came out. He started dancing the wrong way. He started dancing to the wrong person. This is his first sermon. He was so excited. He got excited in the midst of his sermon. And all of a sudden, what's in him came out of him. The same thing came out of him that was coming out of him at the streaming rooster. The fox trap. Grammys. The red rooster. It showed up right in the pulpit. And guess what? He was so worldly, he didn't even catch himself. He just kept right on with it until he got through. And those in the crowd who were a little worldly themselves, they almost got with it. The Bible said these are sensual. These are, these are, are worldly people. These are worldly persons. These are sensual persons who cause division and having not the spirit, not having the spirit. They have not the spirit. They have not the spirit. They got some spirits, but they don't have the spirit. I never will forgive my disappointment about three months ago. I guess I haven't been to the bank in, in, in Pasadena for some years now. So I decided I was going to leave the church and, and run by, by Pearland run by Pearland and, and stop in Louis and get a meal and run on home. When I turned that corner, I looked for Louis. The building is there. But Specs is on the label. Right where Louis was, Specs is there. And so when I posted, I said, man, when did this happen? Then uh, one of the brothers asked me, did you go in? Did you get some spirits? <laughs> Somebody tell us today what Specs is. <clears throat> so Specs was there. And, and they in Specs they have spirits. They have several, they have thousands of spirits. But the text declares those who are not in Christ, those who are false prophets. Those who are breathing out stuff that's not of God, they are in the spirit, but they have not the spirit. They have not the spirit. This word spirit is capitalized in my Bible. It, 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 we, we have the spirit of God if we walk in Christ. You see, there are three, three divisions of man. Number one is the, the natural man. The man that was born here, the man that came out of his mother's womb, he or she is a natural man. They don't have God. They've never received Jesus Christ. They're the natural man, and the natural man is doomed to hell. The natural man does not have the spirit of God. And the second one is, is the carnal man. 
the carnal man. The word carnal means fleshly. The carnal man. And the carnal man been saved, but he act like he's not saved. The carnal man is a man that has not really sold in to Jesus Christ. He received Jesus as a Savior. He's on his way to heaven anyhow. But he's giving in to his loves. He's yielding to temptation. He sins willingly. And when people see him and they, they realize that he went to church, they say, you go to church? Have you ever been asked that before? In that tone? Now, it's okay to be asked, what church do you attend? But to be asked, you go to church? I never will forget um, Pastor Rudy Rasmus. I was was talking and he was introducing Beyonce and he was talking about the fact that he's Beyonce's pastor. And even in the midst of his introduction, he asked the question, so you didn't know Beyonce had a, had a church home next year? <laughs> like, man, you let that one slip. Mm -hmm. So we have to get to a point in our lives where we realize that we're no longer natural men, but when we go into a carnal state, we got to grow to be that third person, the third division of a man is the spiritual man. The Bible says that these men are not spiritual men because the spiritual man obey God, obeys God. The spiritual man walks with God. The spiritual man lives for God. He's a spiritual man. He's a man that loves the Lord. He acts like he loves the Lord. He walks like he loves the Lord. He, he talks like he loves the Lord. Brother told one brother the other day, he said, man, I don't hear that talk until you come around. Well, he's saying, I'm walking in the spirit. I need you to change this thing. He said, I don't, I don't get all that kind of noise until you show up. What he was saying was, well, man, you talk like a natural man. You say you say, but it's not lining up. So the Bible says these men who, who mess up the church, these men that cause their vision in the church, not having the spirit. They are not in contact with God. They are not following God. The wise writer says that there are some people that God does not appreciate what they do. Then it says, but this one is the one that's abomination to God. And it's the one who calls dissension, causes trouble among the brothers. You know, it's a, it's a mighty good thing. It's a mighty good thing when some folk leave the church. I think I said that again. It's a mighty good thing when some folk leave the church. So, Brown, what do you think about that? I mean, peace, there's a, there's a calmness in that. There's a peace in it. Well, I'm just talking about the local church now. I'm not talking about the, 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 the universal church. I'm talking about when they leave from one church and go to another, sometimes the pastor will be like, Phew. and then all of a sudden, hallelujah, Lord, a birth in left. And there's a church for everybody. Sometimes it's not new beginning. And I understand that well. Mm -hmm. A side relief. I mean, matter of fact, the choir starts getting along. <laughs> the first impression gets along. The pastor and the deacons get along. And everybody's wondering, what happened? Why Did we get saved? <laughs> no, we were already saved. It was just somebody causing division in the church. The Bible says those who cause division in the church have not the spirit. Verse 20 says, but you belong building yourself up on your most holy faith. Walk in faith. Build yourself up and build each other up. He says walk in faith. Yourself has to be built up sometime. Anybody can identify with that? Sometimes you got to build up yourself. David was here, he'll tell you, you got to sometimes just encourage yourself. That's right. You can't depend on everybody every time to encourage you. 
Because right in the middle of you being encouraged, somebody will come and snatch you down. They'll have a word from the Lord and destroy you. I told you now, there are three entities that are lied on the most, and it's not you. The first one, they lie on God. God told me to tell you. Well, ask God to tell me himself. So they lie on God. The second one is they lie on the devil. The devil made me do it. When the Bible says you're led away by your own fleshly desires. You, do, you chose to do it on your own. You and your buddies got together and y'all came up with a plan. And the third one now, that's the new kid on the block, COVID-19. Is the one that's lied on a lot. COVID-19. So we have to get to a point in our lives where we really understand that we have to be built up in our most holy faith. A sanctified faith. We have to be built up. We have to be built up. And the only way to build ourselves up is according to the doctrine of the apostles. That's the holy scripture, the central truth of God. We have to have ourselves built up through the love of God. God loves us so much that we should not be down for a long period of time. Right. Now things can shake you. Things can blow your mind. Things can grab you at the wrong time and it can knock you off your game. But you can't stay off long. Because God loves us. He keep ourselves. He keep ourselves. God keeps ourselves through his love. Why do I say keep ourselves? The reason why I'm saying he keeps ourselves is because we can't keep ourselves. And many times we have to be saved and rescued from ourselves. Have you ever prayed that prayer? Lord, rescue me from me. Lord, I don't even like the way I look. I don't like the way I smell. I don't like the way I'm acting. Lord, I don't even like my attitude. Lord, save me from me. So God saves us. He saves us from ourselves. He says we must pray in the Holy Spirit. Now this, this verse has been, been misused so many times. It says pray in the Spirit. What he's saying is not only do you encourage yourself by way of the Holy Spirit, you cultivate the love of God in you. You cultivate, but we cannot be separated from the love of God. Someone turn to Romans 8, 35 and 39, 35 through 39. Romans 8, 35 through 39. Let's go to Romans 8, 35 through 39. Stand and read that real big for me right quickly. It says that we can't be separated by the love of God, from the love of God. We can't be separated. We can't be detached. God loves us in spite of us. In spite of your meanness, God loves you. If no one else loves you, let me just tell you, God loves you. If everybody else walked out on you, God loves you. Amen. Who's there? Come on, stand and read for us real big. Romans 8, starting at 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So when we look at this, it talks about praying in the spirit, right? And many of you have heard that praying in the spirit is speaking in tongues. 
you heard it. I'm going to pray in the spirit. Does that mean that when I pray, I'm not praying in the spirit unless I'm speaking in tongues? Mm -hmm. So when we look at the text, the text is informing us to stay with the word of God. The text is telling us to stay with the apostles' teaching. The text is telling us to stay with the preaching that, that we've heard, which is in the word of God. So when we pray in the spirit, we're praying with God. When we look at the next verse, we'll find out. We're praying according to godly principles. That's why it's important for us to pray the word of God. Because we don't know what to pray. If we knew what to pray, then we wouldn't have to ask God. When we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved down here, we have another building, eternal in the heaven. When this tent down here is dissolved, we have another mansion. And then if you keep reading, it says that our, our bodies is groaning to get there. And the Spirit of God makes intercessions for us. Because we don't know what to pray for. We do not know which to pray. We cannot get to a point where we're so close to God that we know what to pray. Because if we do, it cancels out the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. The Holy Spirit interprets for us. Every Sunday, every Sunday, uh, I'm preaching one person is interpreting. The people who do not speak Spanish is able to hear in real time just a few seconds later what I really mean. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us, but at a much magnified level. Whatever we pray, we pray in what we think we ought to be praying. Lord, give me this. Lord, bless me with this because now look, Lord, when you bless me with this, I'm going to glorify you in it. And then the Holy Spirit takes our prayers, wrap them up in a nice little ball, deliver them to God. It's almost like the Holy Spirit said, now God, I know what he said, but this is what he really means. <laughs> it's like people praying on their way to sin. Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. That's not even wise in the world. Even the ungodly people know that's not how you pray. But the Holy Spirit takes our prayers and he rearranges them. He interprets them and he presents them to God. We just Our job is to pray. And we may be praying intellectually, but the Spirit prays spiritually. And the Holy Spirit delivers it. Like the UPS man delivers it to the right place. And that place is God. So, so it says that we must pray in the spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourself under the mercy of God. Keep looking. Keep looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep looking for the love of God. Keep experiencing the love of God. Keep walking in the love of God. Brother Whitlock read that there's nothing that can separate us. Nor death, nor height. Nor life, nor death. Nor persecution, nor things past, nor things to come. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? Because if you hurt some people feeling, they don't love you anymore. If you turn some people down, they don't love you anymore. If you say something against or disagree with some people, the love just flew out the window. They start singing that song, there's a thin line between love and hate. It's a thin line. And they will show you just how thin the line is. It's a thin line between love and hate. The text doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say that. But everyday human beings will let you know 
that the thin line between. It's like a little spoiled girl that gets upset with her mom and dad and say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, and then get, get ready to eat breakfast in the morning. Throwing temper tantrums. But this God we serve, nothing will separate us from his love. People said, well, it's not a, a loving God gonna let me go to hell. A loving God wouldn't allow me to go to hell. What's wrong with that statement? Is anything wrong with that statement? Did hell, was hell made for anybody? What's wrong with that statement? A, a loving God. If God is such a loving God, he wouldn't allow me to go to hell. Is there a problem with that statement? What's the problem with that statement? Who's, who's talking to me? It's full of ignorance. It's ignorance. Ignorance means not that they don't know. What they, what they don't know? God will allow you to go to hell. Anybody else? They don't know that he is as just as he is loving. He has more than one attribute. He is as just as he is loving. So he's just and he's loving, meaning that he judges just as he loves it. Meaning, that, and the thing, I'm, I'm looking for something else. Anybody else? What's wrong with this statement? A loving God won't let me go to hell. This God you talk about, they have to tell you that you talk about what they're not talking about. This God you talk about is love. Would he let me go to hell? Amen. Who's talking? He's not letting you. What's happening then if he's not letting you go to hell? So you have made a choice. You made a conscious decision. Guys even tell tell jokes about boy when I get down there my boys we and my boys we gonna really party down there. I know they don't say that in, in your church, do they, Sister Brown? They don't they don't talk like that, do they? <laughs> when I get to hell, boy, we sure know we're gonna turn it out. You sure right? It's gonna be a turnout. So, so it says that there is eternal life through Jesus Christ. There's eternity that exists. And we need to make sure that we look to the mercy. We look to the love of God. Because his love is eternal. Nothing separates us because God loves us. He loves us in spite of us. And he, his heart's desire is that no one goes to hell. He said to loving God, he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But people choose to go to hell. Some people act like they want to go to hell. The love of God is so real, it's so merciful, it's so Determined. God is so determined to love us. He wants to love us. He wants to show his love toward us. Verse 22. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. He says on, on some people, some of those who walk in Christ, some of those who are believers, you got to have compassion. Paul says, Paul says in Galatians, whatever you do, have compassion with those who are weak. Paul says, bear the infirmities of the weak. Bear up the sickness of the weak. Bear up the weakness of the weak. He says, you, you need to know your congregation. You need to know your believers. You need to know your loved ones. And you need to know they are weak and some of them just got to have compassion with them. You have to be discerning. You have to pray that the Lord speak to you. Don't always throw the trash out. You got to be loving and compassionate. Just like God is loving and compassionate. We ought to be loving and compassionate. 
Don't just throw your head up and holler at everything. Talking about my nerves bad. I ain't got time for that. Jude says we ought to be loving, compassionate, be able to make this distinction because some folk are just weak. Some folk want to make it, they just can't make it. Some people desire to be on another level, but they've been on the same level for the last 12 years. They want to move up. They, they want to be different. They want to succeed in life. But they're at the same level they've been on for the last 12, 15 years. God says, be patient with them. Be compassionate with them. Keep on loving them. Keep on sticking in there. Because the fact of the matter is, God was patient with you. He was compassionate toward you. And even though you weren't doing what they were doing, is something that you were doing that God wasn't pleased with. Jude says, be compassionate. And on some, have compassion. Making a distinction, being discerning. But others, save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. He said, some of them you just got to be compassionate with, got to be loving toward. You have to talk to them like you're talking to a little baby. But he said, some of those rascals, you got to jerk them out the fire. There are some that are so stubborn, you got to be rough with them. There are some that are going the wrong way. You got to pull them out of the fire, hating even the garment that they have on. You got to hate it. God loves all of us. He just hates our sin. And as God loves us and hates our sin, we ought to have a God-type personality where we are compassionate with some. And then some, we have to jerk them out. We have to just pull them out. You got to have a spirit of discernment on which is which. In other words, use wisdom. You was, everything doesn't fit everybody. You can't handle discipline the same way every time. You got five children, you got five ways of disciplining. <laughs> I mean, all five of them are totally different. All five of them react differently. I never will forget when Levon got taller than mama and she started whipping and he, he just stood there and looked at him. She said, oh, you ain't going to cry, huh? Then he started crying. Then she said, hush up, what you crying about? <laughs> but when you love somebody, you know how much they need. You know how much to give. And you know when to shut it down. And I believe somebody in this room, parents, you can do them the same way. You, now you ain't got to whip for 20 minutes. Shut that crying up. Before I give you something to cry about. And you wonder what was the last 20, 30 minutes all about? <laughs> and then and then there are some children you can sit down and lower your voice and they just break down and start crying. And then the third child is the child that that you can just look at them and they start crying because they hate that they disappointed you. So Love cannot be distributed to everybody the same way. When parents say, oh, I love my children all just alike, they're right. They love all their children alike. But when it comes to discipline, you can't discipline them. Not even two of them. It takes one thing for one, one thing for the other. What I'm telling you tonight is, when it comes to believers, we have to love them to Christ. And some, sometimes when we're loving them to Christ, we've got to be gentle with them, have compassion. Others, you just have to tell them like it is. They, they're not going to understand anything else. But just tell them like it is. Then it talks about even the garments that they have on are defiled by the flesh. It is defiled. And because of being defiled by the flesh, you need to hate even the garments. 
says, pull them out of there. Grab them and jerk them out of there. Verses 24 and 25. Jude closes the book of Jude out. He's warned us. He's told us. And he's begged us to stay away from false teaching and false prophets. He has said to us over and over and over again throughout the whole book of Jude. Matter of fact, Jude tacked right on to John in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and said false prophecy is real. False teacher, teachers are having a field day. And if the church of today doesn't get equipped we're going to be sucked down the drain. Black Israelites, they're stealing black boys. The nation of Islam, just stealing black boys and girls. And we say we got the greater one is in us than in all the world. But we will not get equipped where we can make a ready defense for Jesus Christ. We have to get equipped. We have to learn. We have to go to seminars. We have to go to Bible study. We have to go to Sunday school. We have to allow this to become a part of our daily living because they got some guys out there that are so crafty that they'll put a swimming in your head even if you've been born again for 40 years. And they'll make you think that everything you learn in your local church has been wrong. Saw a person the other day. I mean, the whole family been in church, came up in church. I was like, what church? I don't go to church anymore. Huh? I don't, I don't, go, I don't do that anymore. Because one man spoke to that person. And one man gave that person an indication that, that you have been fooled. Talking stuff like, well, man wrote that Bible God didn't, well, who do you think write it? Man has to write it. But God spoke by way of the Holy Spirit to men that pen the words. Human beings that pen the words. It is God breathed. It is God's breath. It is of God. And then they tell you crazy stuff. Like Kyrie Earth. I'm doing my own. I'm doing my, I'm doing my own research. Well, you weren't there when any of it was written, so what are you researching? <laughs> Kyrie Irving doing his own research on COVID-19, but he gotta go to the same people that Dr. Fauci went to in order to get his research. And he thinks he's gonna come up with some different research. When people have been studying COVID-19, been studying the coronavirus for 50 years. Before the coronavirus as we know it came out, you can look on the back of your aerosol, Lysol can, and it says protect from the coronavirus. That's been out as long as we know. There are people smarter than us in the medical field that has, has done this. And now you got guys that's 20 years old, they, they heard two or three words, and now they're smarter than the men that wrote the Bible. And people are jumping off the hill behind it. We went down the street uh, during Christmas time when the six boys were here, and, and I took the six boys with me, and, and we were giving out baskets down the street for, for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Stopped at one house, guy came out, oh man, thank you. He, then he came out and he began to question the boys. Hey, y'all go to that church down there? Yeah. He said, y'all worship on Sunday? Yeah. Man, you the pastor down there? You, you the, I said, boys, get on the truck. <laughs> You're not telling these boys they ought to be worshiping on Saturday? And every now and then, my righteous indignation will rise up. Because I'm their protector. I said, boys, get on the truck. He said, well, if you're not telling them that Jesus is black, then you can take that food, which I said, boys, get the food. <laughs> so they got the food off the front porch, but he took all the bottled drinks inside. And, and he wanted them to know 
that Jesus is black. And, and it doesn't matter the color. And if it matters, if it does matter, it's not a thing that's a, a deal breaker. Because he is the only Savior. If he's Japanese, he's the only Savior. It doesn't matter what color. I'm not going to get in a debate with you. Matter of fact, you weren't there and I wasn't there. Only thing we can go by is history. And history points to the fact that he's the Jesus of the Bible. So don't get tangled up in that. But we have to learn the word of God and be trained in the word of God to be ready to give an answer at any given time. So after the boys got on the truck and I got in the car and he still didn't want to leave me alone. You know, we're in his yard. <laughs> I had to get out of his yard. But at the end of the day, don't get tied up in all that craziness because the Savior that we serve, his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the only begotten Son of God. He's the one. And this is how Jude closes out. Jude says, now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling. He uses the word stumbling. He says, he now unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling. The person who is already running, the person who is already walking in Jesus, Jesus can keep him from stumbling. He didn't, he didn't say fall. The word is stumbling. He said, can keep us from stumbling. And when you, you investigate this word, this word means to, to be in motion and to fall over or to tilt over. And if you fall, you can just fall. But when you're stumbling, it's because you're in motion. So he's talking to believers. He says, now unto him who can keep us from stumbling. Now unto him who can keep us from falling away from the belief of Jesus Christ. Remember, the context is the fact that we got to stay away from false doctrine. He says, now unto him who can keep us from falling and stumbling away from the belief of the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now unto him, that him, and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy, exceeding joy. He says, this is what God does. Those of us who will stick to the gospel, those of us who will walk in Christ, God is able to keep us from stumbling into some other denomination or, or some other religion or some other doctrine. If we're in motion with the Lord, God can keep us from stumbling back in that stuff. And he said, God presents us unto him. God. God presents us unto himself. Listen what he says. And present us it presents you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God gets excited. God gets excited when you stand for him. God gets excited when you walk on his behalf. God keeps us from stumbling and, and he presents us faultless. This word faultless means without blemish. Is a sacrificial term that they used when they, they were getting ready to sacrifice an animal unto the Lord for the sins of the people. He said, God can present us faultless without blemish before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. God get excited. And verse 25 says, to God I say. Now that tells a hold. And to those who say that Jesus is not God. That one statement right there. Verse 25 says, to God our Savior, to God Jesus Christ our Savior, to whom, to, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, to him be glory, to him be majesty, to him be dominion, to him be power, both now and forever. 
Amen. He says, whatever you do, understand, this is to God our Savior, the one who has delivered us. He says, this is to God our Savior, the only wise one. Let me tell you, if you're going to be saved, it's only through God. If you're going to be delivered, it's going to only be through God. If anyone's going to defend your cause, it's only through God. To God, who is alone, who is the only one, who is the only wise God. To him be glory. To him be majesty. To him be dominion. To him be power. Not just right now, but forever and ever. We serve a God who never changes. The Hebrew writer says he's God today, he's God yesterday, and he's God forevermore. He is the same God. He says, give him glory. I think, I think Jews got a little happy right there. Jews said, Jews said now I told you about false doctrine. He says, but, but now I him who is able to keep us. Now unto him who is able to keep us from, from stumbling. Now unto him who is able when we're in our stride, working for him, living for him, when we're striving for him, in the midst of our stroking for him, we have to understand he's able to keep us from stumbling back into that stuff. God has pulled us out of stuff. And it's only God who can keep us in it. I went to Church of God in Christ, Holy Convocations last week. For seven hours worth of it. For seven whole hours. I only went to see one supervisor elevated and to take some pictures. I came out with 221 pictures. I went to the restroom four times. Every time they got their shot on, I went to the restroom. And it was for seven whole hours. But one thing I had to say, they gave it up for God. I'm telling you, they got their exercise in that day. They, they wiped away their, 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 their odorant that day. Their perfume went up and, sh and smoked that day. But they said, to God be the glory. For everything he's done, the Savior, the mighty one. The woman took up the offering and took 30 minutes. She told, she told three testimonies. She was excited about what God had done. And then she said, okay, any woman that will give me a thousand dollars stay. They start talking. She said, the Lord told me it's seven. See, that's the other thing now. If the Lord told me it was seven, it's going to be seven. Are you with me? How did she end up with 21? She's supposed to be giving the others back. She said, the Lord said, there's seven of you out there, and I'm going to start it off, so it's a total of 8,000 out there that we're going to start this off with. And boy, people got excited, and it was 21 by the end of the day. Then 500. Who will give me 500? Are you with me? But they gave God the glory. Not unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him who is able to keep us from stumbling. Unto him who is able to keep us moving forward. Him the only wise God. He's wise. There is none like our God. Amen. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You know, come to Jesus just as you are. It was Jesus the Christ who's our only God. He's our only Savior. He gave his life for us. He did it on Calvary. Gave up the ghost. They laid him in a barbed tomb. Early that Thursday morning, he rose from the dead. He can rise in your life today. You can be saved right here, right now. The door is open. Will you trust him? If that's you, just repeat after me this simple prayer and invite Jesus into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
We believe that you're born again. We believe that you're saved. We believe that you're going to heaven. We believe that you ought to get into the word of God so the word of God can speak truth to you. And if you're without a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where God is present, where God is presenting us to himself, wiping away the blemishes. Please let us know if you want to join the New Beginning Church, whether you're local or whether you're global. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for who you are, for what you do. We thank you for another privilege. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we've heard your word. Bless your word to continue to speak to us. Bless us as we come to give unto you. Bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. For those of you who want to give electronically, you can do so. By giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Or you can mail in your offering, your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for blessing us with this time. For those of you in the, in the pews, you can come now and bring forth your gift. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. Give glory to God. flyers out, outside. These are geared toward children. Um, we have a hydroponics and aquaponics program here. We have a robotics program here. We have a music program here for our youth and our young people. We have several of these cars that are asking you to pick up them as you leave and give them to somebody with children so we can populate our building with children on these days that these uh, programs are going on. Robotics, hydroponics, and aquaponics, as well as music. So pick up some on your way out. And those of you who are listening live, uh, inbox us and let us know if you're interested in getting your children involved in the technology of the arts. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for this opportunity, Father. We ask you to bless us in our door and keep us and bless us to walk in your will. Thank you for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you for every giver. In Jesus' name we pray. This Sunday we will be celebrating uh, Sister Davis and Sister Matthew Davis at uh, 10.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. We will be celebrating an appreciation service. Come on out. Come on back. Uh, it's good to be appreciated. And I want to welcome you to, to come back. Those of you who are listening, please come and and celebrate with us while we stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for keeping us. Bless us in our travels. Bless us, Father God, as we leave this place. Bless us, Father God, that our home will be found safe. Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, that as we go, others will see Jesus in us. And we will bless your name and they will glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. He's able to keep us from stumbling. He's able to keep us moving on. Now unto him who is able to keep us 
and to present us spotless before himself, the only wise God, be power, be glory, and dominion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Amen. Next week we will be uh, we will be having us having our Bible study virtually. We'll be having our Bible study virtually. So if you with your family members, uh, include them in Bible study. We will be virtually having Bible study next week. Thank you so much. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening the family, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are lifting as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. You are dismissed.